Hey guys, Ega here. Today, instead of one of my usual build videos, I wanted to take a look at undervolting the RDX 5090 Founders Edition. I'll be going over my thoughts and reasoning for undervolting, as well as detailed tests and a like for like comparison against my old card, the RDX 4090, which I've ran undervolted for over two years now. All tests with the 5090 were done on an open bench setup featuring the moddable Sys8 open frame. I did a video on it a couple of months ago and I find it's perfectly suited for an open bench test setup that's also pleasing on the eye. For the CPU I'm running my 7950X3D, cooled by the massive D15 cooler from Noctua. I went with the old generation Chromax Black version here for a stealthy blacked out look. I mounted it in the offset position on purpose to show you guys just how much it gets in the way of the flow through cooler of the 5090 Founders Edition. A smaller tower cooler, like the Thermal Wright Phantom Assassin 120, would probably be the more sensible choice here, and it could potentially even allow for better thermals under a combined CPU and GPU load, simply because it wouldn't get in the way as much, but I digress. I'll be doing some small form factor builds soon enough though, and all the testing I'll be showing you guys today will no doubt prove useful for those upcoming videos. It's worth mentioning as well the plethora of issues and controversies surrounding the 50 series. Supply issues, instances of missing ROPs and thus less performance than advertised, driver issues causing hard crashes, high idle power draw, and lastly, of course, cases of the power connector literally melting. Regarding the latter, for the time being, I'll be using the stock 12V high power cable that came with my Corsair SF1000 power supply. This one has never been used before, so if anything catches fire during my testing, well, this video will serve as evidence. Now, undervolting is not meant as a band-aid fix for the melting connector issues. It's something I would recommend doing anyway with power-hungry cards like the 4090 and the 5090. That said, I do think it adds an extra safety buffer. If we can reduce power draw while retaining most, if not all of the performance, then to me it's a no-brainer. We also get lower temperatures, less noise, and we may even extend the lifespan of the card. But let's take a minute to define what undervolting is. Simply put, undervolting means running the card at a lower maximum voltage compared to its stock out-of-the-box configuration. If we take a quick look at the voltage frequency curve of the 5090 Founders Edition, we can see how the core frequency goes up with each voltage step. In a real-world scenario, the GPU will boost frequency according to this curve until it reaches either a power limit or a thermal limit. So what we can do is to flatten the curve past a certain voltage point, practically introducing a maximum voltage limit. We could stop there, but as you can see from the steepness of the stock 5090 curve, we'd be running at a significantly lower frequency, leading to decreased performance compared to stock, which would be pretty counterproductive. But here's the fun part. We can start increasing the frequency corresponding to our chosen voltage point as high as it can go before the card becomes unstable. Practically, we're overclocking the card, but within a voltage limit. So, in a way, what we're doing here is a remap of the card. This doesn't necessarily mean we have to compromise performance, though. In many cases, we can actually achieve the same or even better performance compared to stock, or at the very least, we can retain most of the performance with a significant reduction in power consumption. But you may ask, why don't GPUs run as efficiently as possible out of the box? That kind of used to be more so the case, and instead the popular thing to do was to overclock and trade higher power consumption for more performance. Back then, the option to do this was left for the user. Starting with the 30 series, what we're instead seeing is a more and more aggressive tuning out of the box that falls into diminishing returns territory. There's many reasons for this shift in strategy, but it likely boils down to a need to show significant gen-on-gen -gen performance improvements. Sacrificing efficiency was just low-hanging fruit, a means to an end. So for me, the goal with undervolting is finding that efficiency sweet spot for better thermals, less noise, and less stress on the power delivery components. If stock or close-to-stock performance can be attained, then even better. Not to mention that all this optimization is practically a requirement if we're doing small form factor builds. So how do we go about creating an undervolt profile then? Well, NVIDIA doesn't let us edit the voltage frequency curve directly. At most, what you can do with the NVIDIA app is to introduce a simple power limit. But that's not nearly good enough for what we want to do today. So the tool of choice here is MSI Afterburner. It has been the bread and butter overclocking and undervolting tool for well over a decade now. Once we get that installed and running, we're going to focus our attention on the curve editor feature. But the first thing we'd want to know is which voltage point do we even pick as our maximum? How do we even determine that? Well, what we could do is use an overlay like RTSS that's already included with Afterburner and observe how our card behaves out of the box, what max frequency does it tend to boost at and at what voltage. 
Then we can use this information and try, for example, to target the same or close to the same frequency as stock, but at lower voltage points. You can go by trial and error here, or look at what others are running and use that as a starting point. Just be aware that each individual card is different. There's no fast pass here. You will need to validate your individual undervolt settings. Here's an example of what that process looks like on my 4090 Founders Edition, but the same concept applies to pretty much any NVIDIA card, with some caveats on the 5090, as we'll see in just a moment. We first click on whichever voltage point we decided is going to be our target and then hold shift while dragging to select all the points to the right. Then we input the offset needed to shift that point up to our target frequency and hit apply. The point may move slightly up or down after hitting apply, but this is normal as frequency can only be set in steps of 15 MHz. Lastly, we drag the previously selected points down, making sure all of them are now lower than our target point and hit apply again. Notice how the curve flattens itself out past our voltage point. We can now close the curve editor and save our settings into one of the profile slots and if you're sure the undervolt is stable, you can have it be automatically applied on system startup. With undervolting, it's really important to understand and accept a few things. First, your undervolt may initially look stable, especially if you've only used a synthetic benchmark or a single game to dial it in, but that's not nearly enough. You need to test thoroughly in multiple games and ideally in titles that use different technologies such as ray tracing, frame generation, or ray reconstruction. Secondly, just because an undervolt is stable today doesn't necessarily mean it will be stable in the future. Future games, workloads, or driver updates may change the way in which the GPU is used and turn your once rock solid undervolt into an unstable one. You basically need to accept that you will be running your GPU on the edge of stability. As such, you need to be aware of that and be prepared. If a crash happens, it's reasonable to first troubleshoot by disabling your undervolt profile, and if it turns out to be the culprit, you will need to redo it, either by dropping down the frequency or going up one or more voltage steps. Personally, I find this kind of tinkering enjoyable, and the benefits are worth it to me, but just be aware that it's not necessarily a set and forget type of thing. On the bright side, there's no way to damage anything. At worst, you may get a hard crash and will need to reboot your system, and that usually means that your undervolt is way off. If instead you get a soft crash, meaning that the game crashes to desktop, then you're probably already in the ballpark. Anyway, with the groundwork covered, let's finally jump into undervolting the 5090 Founders Edition. There's a number of ways in which the 5090 behaves differently when undervolting, but the good news is that it still works more or less in the same way. The main issue stems from the fact that the 5090 voltage frequency curve is much, much steeper than before. Whereas on the 4090, I only needed to boost up a point by, say, 200 MHz or so to get it up to my target frequency, on the 5090, some of the lower voltage points require offsets in excess of 1000 MHz. But here's the problem, the maximum offset cannot be higher than 1000 MHz, that's as far as the software will allow it. I'm not sure if this is a VBIOS limitation or a driver limitation, but it does introduce some challenges. My 5090 sample seems to be stable at pretty much any of the voltage points under 900 mV or so when applying this maximum offset. So my approach was to simply find the voltage point where performance seemed to be more or less in line with stock. Unfortunately, I'm fairly certain there's some performance left on the table due to this limitation. The other odd behavior is that unlike on the 4090, the 5090 doesn't really boost up to the values that show in the voltage frequency curve. Instead, both the actual frequency and the voltage top out somewhere below those targets, but the delta between what is set and what the card actually goes to under load does seem to stay consistent. So what we should instead focus on is the actual performance and power draw, but I will refer to the values set in the curve editor as a reference when talking about my undervolt profiles for the 5090. Before we get into the test results, there's one more undervolting method I'd like to cover here. This one is a lot simpler. It's basically an overclock with a power limit. You limit the card's maximum power target and then increase the core offset as high as you can get it, testing for stability along the way. In my experience, this method gets inferior results, but I included it in my testing and tried to roughly match it with my main undervolt profile in terms of performance so that we can compare it in a head-to-head -head battle with a proper undervolt. So let's start with two synthetic GPU benchmarks to set a baseline. First up, we have 3D Mark Steel Nomad, and all the scores here are averaged across three separate runs. 
at stock, the 5090FE doesn't shy away from bouncing off its maximum power limit of 575 watts, which is just an absolute mental thing to witness. With the first undervolt profile, we managed to shave off 100 watts and surprisingly actually achieve a higher score by 3.2% compared to stock. Going a few voltage steps down, we managed to lower power draw by a massive 26% compared to stock, while still retaining 98.7% of the stock score. The 4090 responded excellently at overclocking memory speeds, and I tried the same thing here with the 5090 to see if we can win back some of the lost performance. With a 2000 MHz boost to memory, we're now within half a percentage point of stock performance, but overclocking memory doesn't seem to be quite the silver bullet it used to be on the 40 series. Lastly, the power limit gets us the worst result, a 20% drop in power consumption for a 5% loss in performance. Next up, we have 3 d Mark Speedway. This time around, the first undervolt profile is just a hair slower than stock, but we get an 18.5% reduction in power while retaining 99.9% .9 of the card's stock performance. The second undervolt profile does fall behind stock performance quite a bit, but we're able to draw power usage by 25% compared to stock. Overclocking memory gets us back some of the performance, but not enough to go back to stock levels. Still, the power savings are significant here. The power limit method gives us the worst result again, with a 5% drop in performance for a 15% reduction in power consumption. Let's look at some real-world tests. First up, we have Alan Wake 2, running the latest DLSS tech from NVIDIA, shown here with path tracing enabled and frame generation running in 2x mode. Out of the box, the 5090 is pulling just shy of 500 watts. Under voltage, using the 885 millivolt profile, we shave off nearly 100 watts and actually gain a bit of performance in the process. Dropping to 870 millivolts, we get a 26.5% reduction in power draw with a performance drop of 2.7%. With the memory overclock applied, the gap closes to just 1.5%. The power limit method doesn't do much for us here, with a measly 10% reduction in power draw and a 1.6% performance loss. Let's continue on with Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition. This title also works as an excellent undervolt validation test as it's quite sensitive to unstable settings. Here, the 5090 is pulling 487 watts at stock. With the undervolt, we get a 25.8% drop in power draw while losing only 1.4% in performance. With the more aggressive undervolt profile, we save a massive 30.8% in power draw, with performance dropping 3.2% to stock. Again, we can claw back one percentage point with the memory overclock. Interestingly, the power limit method gives us almost identical performance compared to stock, but it only saves us 7% in power draw. God of War Ragnarok is next, running ultra settings with the LAA. Stock, it's pulling an eye-watering 539 watts. Undervolting drops that to 417.5 watts, costing us only 1% in lost performance. The second undervolt profile reduces power draw by a nice 30%, but performance suffers as we fall back 4.1% behind stock. With the memory overclock added on, we do claim back 1% for a slight increase to power draw. The power limit method is again disappointing, with a poor performance to power ratio compared to the undervolt profiles. Next up, Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, perhaps one of the smoothest running and smoothest feeling titles I've had the chance to try in a long time. Stock, it's pulling 511 watts. The first undervolt profile actually gets us more performance, 2.7% to be exact, all while running at a reasonable 392 watts. Funny that, how 400 watts can sound reasonable. The second undervolt profile swings into the negatives with a hit of 2.2% to performance. Again, the memory overclock closes that gap to 98.9% .9 of the stock performance, and it does so by running at exactly 30% less power. Well worth the compromise, in my opinion. The power limit method is not too bad in terms of performance, but again, only a 10% reduction in power is not enough to impress me. Lastly, let's take a look at the fully path traced portal with RTX. Stock, it's pulling the most power outside of the two synthetic tests, nearly 560 watts, absolutely mental. The first undervolt profile reduces power draw by 25%, but we do have to take a 2.8% hit to performance. Dropping to the 870 millivolt profile has us see the worst result of all the tests, with a loss in performance of 6.3%, but reducing power draw by a third compared to stock. 
Enabling the memory overclock on this profile closes the gap to 4% behind stock for just 10 more watts. The power limit method actually gets us a respectable result here, but I'd still choose the first underval profile over it, perhaps with the memory overclock added on top to get closer to stock performance. I think that, at least with the series of tests that I've ran for this video, it's quite clear that undervolting is absolutely worth it. The diminishing returns territory of running the card on stock settings is simply unreasonable in most cases. And this is without even taking into account the current undervolting limitations on the 5090 that likely leave some gains on the table. There's something else I want to show you guys. I ran some of the same tests on my undervolted 4090 Founders Edition and I picked the most power efficient undervolt profile for both cards. This is not necessarily a scientific comparison, but more of a subjective one based on what undervolt profiles I'd run on these cards for maximizing efficiency. In Alan Wake 2, the undervolted 5090 performs 18.4% better for an increase in power of 19.8% over the 4090. In the Metro Exodus Enhanced Edition test, we get a lead of 21.2% for 24.5% more power. God of War Ragnarok gives us a small glimpse at some efficiency gains here, with a nearly 30% performance lead traded for 23% increase in power consumption compared to the 4090. Lastly, in Kingdom Come Deliverance 2, we get 26% more performance at the cost of 23.8% more power. There seems to be a clear pattern here. The 5090 scales almost linearly with power, and even when undervolted, it struggles to show efficiency gains over a similarly efficiency-tuned 4090. Still, the fact remains that if you want more performance than a 4090 has to offer, the 5090 is the only way to get there. But let's not make any excuses. The generational uplift here is very disappointing, and you're paying for it in more than one way. That said, it should be noted that, as I mentioned earlier, there's likely a bit more juice left in these undervolt profiles. Right now, the big thing for me would be a way to set higher offsets than 1000 MHz, or indeed a less steep voltage frequency curve that may come in the form of a driver or VBIOS update. Right after I finished all my testing and the script for this video, there was one driver update that gave me some hope. Some users reported that the 57275 hotfix driver boosted their voltage frequency up by a couple hundred megahertz, but unfortunately for me it looked and behaved exactly the same as before. For now, I'll simply wait until the driver situation is a bit more stable before rerunning all my tests. Anyway, I talked a lot about performance and power draw in this video, but nothing about temperatures. With small form factor builds, undervolting the 5090 Founders Edition will be a must in order to keep temperatures under control and without having it sounding like a jet engine. The first build I'll be doing a video on will be an updated form T1 build, and I can't wait to show you guys what I have planned. But until then, here's an example of just how big of a difference undervolting can make when it comes to temperatures. I picked Alan Wake 2 as a reference here and manually locked the fans to 45%. On the stock setting, pulling about 500 watts, we reach a maximum temperature of 77 degrees on the GPU core after 10 minutes. Enabling the undervolt profile sees us drop 10 degrees. That's 10 degrees less, 100 watts less, and slightly better performance than stock. Think about that. Granted, all of this is on an open bench, and results will no doubt vary inside small form factor cases, but I think this shows that there's ample room for optimization. Although, to be fair, the massive Noctua D15 cooler I'm running on the CPU is blocking off quite a bit of airflow coming out of the flow-through fan on the 5090. If you think about it, this setup is quite similar to a sandwich-style layout where the fan would be blocked off by the motherboard. If anything, this classic layout may even be worse with this huge tower cooler getting in the way. One last thing I'd like to add regarding temperatures. For my daily use with the 5090 FE, I've modified the stock fan curve using MSI Afterburner to this simple 3-point curve. With the undervolt profile enabled, the card usually runs the fans at about 35-40% to under load, which is very impressive considering the power draw and the level of performance that this card can deliver. The cooling solution Nvidia has been able to develop here is nothing short of an engineering marvel, and because it was designed to handle the card at its insane stock power draw, when undervolted it can run reasonably cool and quiet. I only wish fan speeds could be set lower than 30%. I would then keep the fans always on, even during productivity tasks. Um, the constant starting and stopping of fans is very annoying, and the high idle power draw means it will do this quite frequently. That's it for this one, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I know it's a bit different and not one of my usual build videos, but do let me know if you'd like to see more of it in the future. Hopefully I'll have an awesome build video out for you guys real soon. Bye for now.